So our next speaker, uh, Thomas Athe from uh, Johns Hopkins University, um, that I have to say that whose work involves the most mesmerizing pictures I see in neuroscience. So uh, Kami will post a link related to his work and I encourage uh, everyone in the audience to check it out. So uh, Thomas, ready to show us some pretty picture pictures? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction, Chang. Um, can I just get a thumbs up that you can uh, hear and see my slides? Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some work in progress about automated um, neuron tracing. And just to start with some background. So whenever you talk about neuron morphology, you kind of have to sh give a shout out to Ramoni Cajal, um, who is the first to kind of sit down um, and uh, in a diligent way, look at different neurons and categorize them according to their shapes, according to their morphologies. On the left is one of his um, beautiful drawings uh, exhibiting different neurons and their different morphologies. But uh, neuron morphology is not just a thing of the past. Um, in contemporary research into projection neurons, uh, morphology plays a, a, a key role, um, for example, um, in defining the major subtypes of projection neurons. We have neurons that go from cortex to cortex, those that go from cortex to thalamus, and those that project below the cerebrum. Um, but uh, morphology is not just relevant in uh, uh, subtyping and classification. It's, it's pretty key in understanding learning. So in a classical neuroscience experiment, um, the figure on the left here uh, shows that in an experiment where they sewed shut the eyes of some kittens um, and then studied the visual pathway uh, between eyes that were sewn shut and eyes that were um, allowed to be open and, and look at the visual world, there was a, a, a difference in the morphology of the axonal arbors. Um, here on the on the bottom and on the top, uh, but not just learning uh, in in evolution. So us as primates, humans, um, we have enlarged upper layers of our cerebral cortex, and those are associated with particular morphological subtypes of projection neurons. Um, in particular, the the ones that project to other locations in the cortex. And if I haven't motivated you enough, I think we're all motivated by research funding. Um, and the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, which is funding a lot of neuroscience research in this area, uh, has the explicit goal to identify um, different brain cell types and uh, morphology is, is one of the key pillars in, in that uh, um, work. Oops. Okay, so uh, neuron reconstruction um, or the tracing of neurons in order to, uh, to study morphology is not a, it's not a new um, research area. There's been a lot of research into it in particular in the past decade, for example, under Diadem and Big Neuron, um, these initiatives where many different solutions were proposed, deep learning solutions, reinforcement learning solutions, and a host of others. Um, however, the primary, primary li limitations of the existing methods are that they assume there's a single neuron in the image. Uh, the methods don't really extend um, to projection neurons. And some of the solutions in particular, the deep learning ones rely on a lot of voxel wise ground truth, which is hard uh, to come by. So the data we're working with um, comes from the Janelia Research Campus, in particular their mouse light team. So we have uh, some complete mouse brain images uh, from two photon tomography that are at the submicron resolution and you can see these, these colored lines here are reconstructions of projection neurons. And uh, this process is already done in a semi-automated way. However, it's still the bottleneck in, in producing these data sets. Um, so, so my problem or my, my research is into making this more uh, efficient. So I'm gonna kind of describe the algorithm I'm working on. Um, and uh, we'll, any good imaging pipeline starts with some pre-processing. Um, uh, basically, the only the important thing here is that uh, we can apply a, a, a neural network to predict whether a voxel in the image is part of foreground or background, um, part of a neuron or, or not part of a neuron. And in, in most uh, computer vision tasks, uh, this would all this would be all you need to do. Um, you know, is this voxel part of the sky? Is it part of the road? Is it part of a person? Um, and then you would be done. However, the shape of neurons is these kind of spindly things with long dendrite or long axons and these curly dendrites means that 
if, if you have a false negative along anywhere along the axon, you could cut the neuron completely in half. So um, uh, the existence of these false negatives means you're going to have a lot of fragments that you need to string together. So on this animation is just kind of uh, illustrating some of the different neuronal fragments that may be predicted um, by a neural network. Uh, and this is just a few of many. And the problem now becomes, how do we string these together into a complete um, neuron? And for that problem, we turned to hidden Markov modeling. So hidden Markov modeling is a classic uh, statistical modeling technique where we have two sequences of random variables, one of which, the one I denoted with x, is unknown or hidden. Um, and the other one is, uh, is observed um, in, in this picture, it's z. And uh, the, the classic use of this hidden Markov modeling was back in the 80s with speech processing, where you have you observe this audio signal, um, which would be Z, and you're trying to estimate the words uh, that gave rise to that audio signal. Um, in our case, uh, what we're trying to estimate is a sequence of, of image locations, kind of a path uh, winding through the image. And what we observe is, is parts of the image associated with that path. So the, the real beautiful thing about hidden Markov modeling, the reason why people do it is because uh, estimation is, is very efficient. So the problem of, of computing the maximum, the maximum a posteriori estimate of, a se of that sequence of hidden variables or the map estimate uh, becomes just a shortest path problem through a graph. So I'm trying to estimate the most likely uh, hidden path according to uh, the posterior distribution and this is a shortest this becomes a shortest path problem so in the in the in the little animation here i have uh um the classic illustration of, of finding the most likely sequence of states from left to right so the vertical the different rows are the different possible states and the the different columns are the different uh elements in a sequence and you can estimate the most likely path uh, with what's known as the Viterbi algorithm. It's an example of dynamic programming, um, and it works in an iterative, iterative man manner, as shown in the um, in the uh, animation there. So I want to uh, give a brief um, uh, video of of the Viterbi algorithm working on on um, neurons. It, it's kind of a, a short video. But I, before I, I get it started, I just want to explain that um, the green sections, so you'll see the green, and that is the, the most likely um, neuron path at that given iteration. And then the red paths are kind of the less likely, but, um, but still attractive alternative candidates. And you'll see the green is, is kind of moving along and the red is, is out exploring until the green makes it back to the SOMA. So you can see the red is out exploring over here. It's kind of going to the cell body. It's, it's going to other uh, dendrites here and the green is hanging out until it comes um, all the way back uh, to the soma. So, so this algorithm would work. You would, you would kind of place a bunch of points distally and then trace uh, all the paths back to, um, to the appropriate cell body. And it's worth noting that you know, this path could have gone to these other cell bodies um, but they, uh, those paths were not as likely in terms of posterior probability and, that, and thus did not arise in the, um, in the segmentation. Um, so this is just a static image uh, of kind of, you know, you would um, have points be placed distally on the neuron and then it would trace them automatically back to, uh, to the soma here. So we have a grayscale image, I have red highlighting um, kind of the segmentation or the trace that is that is being done from each of these green starting points. So what I'm working on now, I, I definitely have a lot of uh, work cut out for me for the rest of my um, PhD. The, the main uh, focus is scaling this up. So I kind of showed you a, you know, a 200 micron approximately cubed sub volume. I need to scale it up to the whole mouse brain. Um, which uh, will really be leveraging the dynamic program, dynamic programming to do that. Um, and then we'll also need to quantify um, 
the performance of, of these reconstruction uh, of this reconstruction algorithm and there are uh, established ways of doing that. Um, so that will be uh, straightforward. So uh, thank you all for um, coming to join me on the, in this talk. Um, and thank you to all the people on the screen uh, for um, helping me with uh, the material that I presented. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to take any questions at this point. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, thank you for keeping on time. And uh, th those captions were great. And uh, my sense is that the audience uh, is still taking time, uh, typing questions and, and voting for them. So I'll, I'll just ask the straightforward ones. Um, I'm wondering how much you have to tune your model to fit a specific set of data. Um, like um, there are uh, other, Data, uh, there, there, there are other data sets out there. For example, I know uh, Alfonso Silva, is that probably the name, uh, who um, worked on uh, uh, mama sets and where I think they took a heroic effort of doing a lot of these things manually. So I, I'm wondering if you, if you apply your models to uh, data like uh, outside of you know the 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 ones you you presented. How how well do you think it will uh, extrapolate? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, I think uh, the key. So my my two comments um, with regards to that are one probably the most. So I acknowledge I, th this mouse light data set is very high quality. I think it's it's a, a big reason why um, you know where I get to show cool cool animations. Um, so. It's definitely true. If, if the images are not good, there's there's really nothing. Um, there's not much that that you can fix on the computational side. You really need to start with good images. Um, I think the main the main key uh, of why I would see it generalizing um, or not generalizing would be kind of how the level of sparsity of labeling in these neurons. Um, so there's about a hundred or so neurons per brain in the data sets we're working with. Uh, and uh, I don't, in working with the different brains I have been, um, as long as that level of sparsity is a, around the same, it's pretty easy to deal with things like, you know, mean shifts and, and, and stuff like that. Um, however, I could see it failing if, if a ton of neurons in the same spot are all, are all labeled. The, the final comment I want to make is um, the longer term plan is to make this kind of an interactive thing uh, because the algorithm works in an iterative manner. Um, we can flag the points at which the algorithm is unsure um, where to proceed. And, and then uh, like a, a manual reviewer could come in and efficiently um, figure out uh, what, the, what the appropriate path is. So I think, I think for those reasons, um, it, it, should, it should generalize to, to images of, of similar sparsity um, and uh, of similar quality. Thank you, Thomas. I think that that pretty much covered the, the question from Benjamin Pedigo, but I'm gonna ask it anyways, uh, in case you have anything to add. So he said, uh, would the dynamic programming approach be fast enough that it could work in real time with a human annotator as in, you know, help improve the semi-automated approach? And I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, certainly for one neuron at a time, which would the, which would be as much as a, as a human could could handle. Um, it's as much as a human does in, in the real world anyway. Um, uh, yes, it, it, it could. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, we need to move.